I'm at CIA headquarters joined by David Robarge, the CIA's chief historian. David, thanks for talking with us today. Happy to be here. We are standing underneath an incredible airplane. What is it? It's the A-12 Oxcart, the CIA's high-speed, high-flying reconnaissance aircraft. What kind of intel did this airplane bring us? It was a photographic platform. So it overflew Vietnam and the demilitarized zone during the 1967-68 period. It took photographs of bomb damage. It looked for troop movements, uh, supply routes, uh, depots, rockets, uh, surface-to-air missiles, things that could hurt our pilots that were flying missions there. And the cameras that were on board, they weren't digital, were they? No, these were old-fashioned film cameras that could resolve a item that was one foot in size from another item one foot in size, kind of like the size of this book. It could distinguish it from one held next to it. Wow. How did they process those images? When it returned to its base in Guam, the camera was taken out of the bay, the film was extracted, and then it was sent all the way to Rochester, New York, because it was a special Kodak film, and only Kodak could process it. Now you can see that this would take a long time to happen and in a battlefield situation you need quicker return. So we started to use a processing facility in Japan that was already there for the U-2 and that enabled very quick turnaround of the intelligence. How did it get the name Oxcart? That was a random code name assigned by the project manager John Perangoski. He looked at a list of code names and he had a kind of a wry sense of humor and he said why don't we name the fastest aircraft ever after one of the slowest <laughs> means of transportation in the world? So, Oxcart. Tell me about Kelly Johnson and Skunk Works. Skunk Works was a special research facility in Burbank, California, where Lockheed did some of its most secret design work, such as on the U-2 and on the A-12. Kelly Johnson was one of the U.S.'s uh, most brilliant aeronautical engineers, responsible for a number of path-breaking aircraft during World War II in the 1950s. And when he had had such success with the U-2 aircraft, we went ahead and enlisted his services and Skunk Works to make the A-12 also. What's the difference between an A-12 and the SR-71? They're often confused because this was a secret aircraft and the SR-71 was publicly known. The main difference is this has one pilot because all he needed to do, all he needed to do, was fly the aircraft and turn the cameras on and off. The SR-71 took other kinds of intelligence. It had other sensors on board, so you needed a special officer to sit behind the pilot to work those machines. It's also smaller and lighter than the SR-71 and flies a bit faster and a bit higher as well. What did a typical mission look like as far as like when they got in to when they came back? Okay, a typical mission for an A-12 would take anywhere between four and five hours. You started out in Guam, you took off with a slight load of fuel, then you got your fuel tanks topped off by a tanker, then you flew your mission over the target area. If you were doing one loop, you got refueled again to get back home. If you were doing a second loop, you got refueled for just that loop. In Thailand, we had a base there where the tankers operated out of. Then they would fly back to Guam, jettison some of the fuel in case of an accident, and then land. And that would all take anywhere from, as they say, four to five hours. Why didn't they take off with a full load of fuel? This aircraft, though it flies very fast at 80,000 feet, is really kind of cumbersome at low altitudes. And with a full fuel load, it would be very hard to get up to speed and to maneuver properly. When you look at the bottom of this airplane, it doesn't seem very aerodynamic and smooth. Why is that? That's because the skin of the aircraft expands when it heats up. So just kind of like uh, gaps in roadways uh, so they can expand into the heat. The same thing here. Wow. What's it made out of? A metal called titanium, which is very heat resistant. This aircraft flies so fast that the fuselage heats up in some places to 800 degrees, and that's far higher than conventional metals can stand. So we had to use a highly heat-resistant metal, titanium. What's your favorite part about this airplane? The quirks, I'd say. Uh, the leaks, for example. Uh, you can't see it here because it has no fuel in it, but if it were loaded with fuel, it would be dripping behind us. 
and that's because the special fuel that Shell Oil made for us didn't settle well in the tanks because of the sealants. It dissolved the sealants. And they never figured out how to solve that chemically. So instead, they realized once it was up to flight speed, the whole aircraft expanded several inches, and that physically sealed the joints in the tanks. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for showing us around. You're welcome. If you like this video, be sure to follow STEM and 30 on Facebook and Twitter, and subscribe to the National Air and Space Museum's YouTube channel.